the participants here, we have uh, Dr. Kyla Sask, who uh, is, oh, everyone here is in biomaterials. And you also know Dr. Zitomirsky, uh, who teaches you all 2X, hello. And Dr. Granfield can't be here today, but we, we have uh, the next best thing, which is her two grad students, uh, Kiara and uh, Joe. Do you guys want to just give a wave? And yeah, they have the nice Dr. Granfield research group in the background. And we'll just, uh, for now, just give everyone here, the participants, just like, you know, a minute or two, just to introduce who they are. And I'd like you guys, if you're, uh, for the professors, just to say what courses you're teaching, as well as uh, what, in general, what your research is and where it's going and so on and so on. For the grad students, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and your work, and we'll start that. So we'll start off with Dr. Sask. Go ahead. Sure. Hey, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Kyla Sask, and I joined the Department of Material Science and Engineering last September. Uh, my research area is obviously biomaterials with a focus on protein and cell interactions with materials. So our, our main application has been blood contacting devices. So implantable devices, but also devices uh, that could be used for diagnostics. So we're really interested in proteins and how they absorb to materials and now how they change in structure and how we can really characterize those interactions and then improve them to design better materials that can be used in devices. So a lot of the times we're focusing on soft materials, but we're starting to get into some metals and I'm looking at various modification strategies. Right now I am teaching in the iBiomed program, the 1P10 course. So I'm co-instructor for that with Dr. Colin McDonald. I'm also involved in the 4Z capstone projects um, as an advisor for a couple groups there. I think that's the, the general introduction for me. Great, uh, thank you for that. And go ahead, Dr. Sijomarski. Uh, hello, thank you for introduction. Uh, I'm teaching uh, to XO3 uh, crystallography and uh, teaching materials production, uh, functional materials courses, electrochemistry at graduate level. And uh, our research is uh, focused on biomedical implants, we synthesize uh, bone substitute uh, material, uh, hydroxylapatite, uh, nanoparticles, and we, we are working on biopolymers. We found possibility of electrodeposition of different polymers, not only charged, but neutral polymers. And uh, we modify uh, uh, biopolymers to improve biocompatibility and other properties. We make uh, coated implants using uh, hydroxylapatite, uh, different bioceramics, uh, bioglass. We inc incorporate uh, proteins, enzymes, uh, drugs, uh, and other functional materials. Significant part of our work is related to particles and coatings for drug delivery. Also, we are working on uh, biosensors. And, and other applications. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you for that, Dr. Zitomirsky. And uh, for Dr. Granfield's grad students, Kara and Joe, um, how do you guys want to do this? You guys, I guess sure, you yeah. both talk. Uh, oh, perfect. There we go. Go perfect, ahead. Yeah. Yes, our group has uh, three main pillars that we do for research, and those are biomaterials, biointerfaces, and looking at biomineralization. Uh, so on the biomaterials front, um, that's kind of where I'm most specialized in. It's developing low weight, low stiffness materials for hip replacements, knee replacements, dental screws, anything that interfaces with bone. Uh, and specifically that's using 3D printing techniques with metals. On the bio interfaces front, um, we look at how all of these different materials associate at the bone implant interface. Um, so we do things like in vitro culture, for example. So we look at how cells can interact with these materials in the lab. Um, we do high-end microscopy to visualize how these are interacting with the surface to determine if bony ingrowth for that implant is optimal or what changes need to be made. Uh, Chiara, you want to go over? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Chiara. And in the Grantly Research Group, I mainly deal with biomineralization. That is, very, is a very specific term 
that we use uh, to talk about uh, how mineral in bone is formed and where it is located, because there are still many open questions about bone structure at very small length scale, so nanoscales. So for studying bone at this uh, level of detail, we need very powerful instruments. And in fact, uh, a lot of our work is done at the Canadian Centre for Electron Microscopy, the CCM, that is located in the basement of ABB, for those who don't know. Here, we're, we've just included some images acquired with a scanning electron microscope. In the top images, for example, you can see this bone tissue with some red blood cells. In the middle image, we have a 3D printed implant uh, from Joe's project. So these pores uh, that uh, are believed to function very well for bone implants. And then in the bottom, we have an example of uh, bone cells. So how our bone cells look like in the electron microscope. As well, in the past, uh, Dr. Granfield has historically taught first year courses uh, with iBiomed 1P10 and Materials 1M03, but she's actually away on sabbatical this year, so she's not doing any teaching. All right. Great. Thank you guys for that. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it off uh, to the MSC Society's co VP academic. Uh, Sophie, who's going to go through and ask some little prompt questions to get some more information out of you all. And uh, as for the, the second years and uh, whatnot who's attending, if you have any questions, just feel free to either like hit the raise your hand on Teams or type in chat like, hey, I have a question, and then we'll just stop and whenever it's a good time, and then you can ask your question. And Actually, ahead, I, so, sorry, just for interruption, yeah. I, yeah. I have yeah. several slides illustrating yeah, yeah. our research. Later, if you want, I can That's, show you. That is perfect. Yeah, that, okay. that'll go well with the questions. Thank you, Igor. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Sophie, take it away. Yeah, so I guess our first point, those were kind of our, our brief overviews. But if um, I know, Igor, you had said you had some slides you want to show. So um, I guess the first question to kind of segue in is maybe where you think your work can or will go or where it is currently going in your lab. Um, so if we wanted to start with that question, I think kind of cycling through everybody might be the best way to do that just so that we get something from everyone. Um, maybe we can just do the same order as what we did for the intros and we'll stick with that um, moving forward. So yeah, where do you think your work can or will go um, or, or where is it going right now? Yeah, and, and sorry for uh, Igor, Dr. Zuzmarski, if you want, you can show your slides soon and give your general overview of okay. what you're thinking uh, maybe about. Maybe I'll try to answer this question first, <laughs> sure. uh, and then I'll show slides. Sure. Uh, a significant part of our research is related to colloidal processing of materials. And now we are involved in COVID-19 kits development, and we developed very interesting technology. We modify uh, magnetic particles and then we supply those particles to St. Joseph Ghost Hospital. And just our goal is to scale up this procedure and supply <laughs> supply kits for, for testing. And uh, it's uh, just our uh, experience in uh, synthesis of nanoparticles and modification is now <laughs> useful for, for really important, very, very important practical applications. And uh, I, I can show you some slides with you. Okay, quickly. Okay, it's uh, equipment for synthesis uh, for synthesis of hydroxylapatite. We, we mix together two stock uh, solutions and uh, uh, from the left side is before synthesis and from the right side you see hydroxylapatite. This white uh, suspension is suspension of non-structured hydroxylapatite particles and hydroxylapatite particles are different in different parts of human body and we can match those particles. We, we can change size, we can, we can uh, change particle size uh, and uh, we also we can uh, we learn a lot from nature. For example, mollusk shells they are multi-layer, and it's because it's why they are so strong. And we are working on um, and we are working on multi-layer 
multi-layer coatings in order to improve fracture toughness, we combine different polymers and ceramics, and we developed coat, develop, uh, coatings, different coatings by electro deposition, uh, hydroxylapatite, uh, chiral polymers, and other materials. Electro deposition results in many uniform coatings. And another example, natural bone is a multi-layer material, and hydroxylapatite particles are oriented in specific way, in specific crystallographic direction. And so the X-ray diffraction pattern shows that pattern shows that our particles are also oriented uh, in the same way as in natural bone. And you see multi-layer which my students uh, create. Uh, what else we learn from nature? Some species in nature are very well attached to different surfaces, but and uh, we, we are trying to learn from nature. What you can see here is uh, uh, muscle adhesion to, to different surfaces. They have uh, special proteins which are uh, attached to the surface in uh, sea water and adhesion is very strong. And we are trying to make similar materials using dopamine and other surfactants to, to get a good quality films for biomedical applications. Also, a significant part of our research is related to application of bile acids. They are multifunctional materials, and if you're interested in functional properties of bile acids, you, you can uh, ask maybe <laughs> Rebecca Sikema. She did an amazing job this summer in my group and published two papers already in high impact factor journals and another one in preparation. And they disperse different nanoparticles in human body uh, and we use them for functionalization and dispersion of carbon nanotubes for application of biosensors and uh, for dispersion of uh, uh, different uh, polymers, uh, drugs and other materials. And we are using uh, our coatings for biosensors. You can see testing results for uh, glucose biosensors. When we inject uh, glucose, you can see steps in current or potential dynamic studies that shows, uh, uh, which shows a detection of uh, 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 visual detection of hemoglobin. Okay, and if you have any other questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Hello? Did... Oh, Sophie, are you there? Yep, sorry, I'm here. Right. I, think, I don't think we have any, I think we'll go through kind of everyone's answer to this question and then um, we'll move forward with those. So maybe uh, Dr. Sass, if you wanted to go next. Sure, I have a few slides I can put up as I talk mm -hmm. as well, um, but maybe I'll, I'll briefly address the, the point and then, and then share my screen. Um, I do say, so I'm excited about a lot of the areas that we're we're planning to go and hopefully we'll we'll get to with our research. Um, I'd say first off, we are uh, some of our focus on is on fundamental understanding of these interactions of proteins with materials. And the reason being is that there's there's so much there's so many questions still that are unanswered and there's limitations in what we can do, what's available right now in terms of visualizing and understanding the structure of proteins on material surfaces. So that takes us to some new characterization techniques that we're investigating and developing and, and allowing us to be able to do that. And then we're, we're also looking at applying these so that we can develop better materials in long-term implanted devices. So for blood contacting devices, some examples are things like uh, stents, vascular grafts, and heart valves, and I'll show a few images in a moment. Um, and also devices that are a little shorter, used in shorter term applications, so for blood oxygenation. I'll show you an example of a project there. 
And then as well, uh, diagnostic devices. So biosensors, the way proteins and antibodies orient and conform and, and immobilize on materials are some areas. So I'll quickly share my screen here to just kind of overview this. I think it should be. Yeah, up let's there. Okay, great. So this just uh, summarizes the main research areas, biomaterials, some nano, we're, we're getting into some micro and nano patterning of materials. And again, just really getting better understanding of, of how they look at that micron and nano scale by characterizing them with new methods um, and then hoping to be able to functionalize them. Uh, for particular use. So again, I think this on blood contact, some of these protein and cell interactions and modifications. Biofouling is another problem of devices. And specifically within these, we do have an interest on the pediatric side. So I'll show you one quick example of that. Um, we're more so looking at soft materials like polymers, but again, some applications with metals that are then coated with polymers, nanotech and, um, and new proteomic methods. This is just some of the oops, the instruments and, and facilities that we use. Again, the, the CCEM, um, CDT, we're doing some uh, fabrication in that facility at McMaster Engineering. We hope to use the future Center for Advanced Light Microscopy um, and also Micro Nano Systems Lab and the Biointerfaces Institute. We use um, atom atomic force microscopes there um, and other instruments. Some examples of polymers, but I want to skip just to this example of a um, microfluidic oxygenator project that we've worked on uh, with collaborators, the main collaborator in mechanical engineering, Ravi Selvaganapathy, as well as uh, pediatric and neonatology clinicians, um, where the, the need is to, to have this device that can oxygenate the blood of preterm infants. And we're focusing on modifying the PDMS to improve the blood compatibility. This has been an ongoing project for almost um, now over 10 years. Um, it's come a long way and we have a graduate student that will be working on, on this uh, over the next uh, four years. So lots of opportunities to get involved in this and other projects in the lab. That's great. Yeah, it's super exciting to kind of see how different everybody's are, but also how they're all kind of tied to the same topics. Um, did the Granfield Research Group want to go next? Yeah, uh, I will take these. So as we were saying before, uh, our group dedicates a lot of time at investigating bone at the nanoscale, at very, these very small scales, well, a lot of uh, uh, proteins interactions uh, and interactions with our blood system happens. And one of the reasons why we want to understand uh, the structure of bone is, for example, we could uh, use uh, this understanding to develop uh, new therapies for solving bone diseases like osteoporosis and also diabetes that are very widespread in the population and are somehow related to bone structure and can affect bone structure as well. And then if we are able to understand how bone is organized better, then we can use these uh, structure to like we can reproduce this structure with synthetic biomaterials so we can develop new biomaterials or modify the surfaces of already existing materials like titanium, for example. And so in this way, we can improve uh, the performance of uh, bone implants. So both like things like hip prosthesis or also dental implants. And we can also use this knowledge to what's referred as a personalized medicine. So we can, for example, 3D print implants. So they are very cust highly customized. So we can have implant to solve really patient specific problems and these can improve a lot the success of bone implant surgeries. If we look at like the, the lifespan of your average hip implant, it might only span about 15 to 20 years. And so much of that is because of the materials that are being used um, to build that hip implant. So just to kind of add on to what Kiara said a little bit, by improving that much, those materials, we can increase the lifespan of the hips, the knees, the dental implants that are going inside of our body, meaning that we need uh, fewer surgeries as a result of implant failure. Because we see thousands of those surgeries every year in Canada, 
Each of those costs maybe $20,000. It quickly becomes a multi-million dollar industry um, within Canada. And then you expand that to the world, it's, it, it's, it's a billion dollar industry kind of across the globe. Awesome, yeah. So that's great to kind of see the overview in a, in a little bit more detail of what everybody's doing in their labs. Um, our next question sort of related to the going back a bit further. Um, how did all of you decide you wanted to pursue academia? Um, so maybe whoever wants to kind of start with that, maybe some people would like um, a, a little bit longer to think about the response, but um, does anyone want to start? Actually, for now, we, we have a question from uh, Dr. Zarab we can ask for Dr. C. Tamersky. So while you guys think about that, we can do this. All right, so uh, Dr. Zarab is asking for uh, Igor, could you please share some details on the work on COVID-19 and how material science and engineering concepts are used in that work? Uh, for, for this application, uh, we need magnetic particles. Uh, we need iron three or four particles magnetite, which have which are biocompatible and have high magnetization, 92 EMU per gram. And such particles are used also for, for drug delivery, for tumor treatment. And for this particular application, we coated them with silica coating. And we applied techniques not only for synthesis of nanoparticles, but also coating techniques. And then we modified such particles uh, and modifier molecules are interacting with RNA. And using magnetic particles, we can remove uh, absorbed material from suspension and release. Uh, actually, it's a material science job. And, and just all the, all the uh, COVID testing is in uh, hospital, but we're doing material science part. And really it's very interesting and i uh, happy that uh, we can apply our expertise in uh, colloidal chemistry and surface modification for this important practical application. Great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I saw Dr. Sass, you had a slide that maybe you wanted to add on the same topic as well. So go ahead with that. Sure. Yeah, I was just able to quickly pull this up because in the course I'm teaching, I was able to share with all of the first years just some examples to to um, in general um, highlight how important material science and engineering is in, in this type of research. And obviously that was a, a great example from Dr. Zidomirsky on a really specific area and there's so many um, ways that material science and engineering um, is being used to help combat COVID-19 in research and this is just an example um, an overview and I had showed them this this journal cover from it was the materials research society bulletin that was in published in December 2019 and talking about electron microscopy specifically cryo EM but how it's been used in biology and and it was used to help uh, visualize and um, characterize spike proteins on COVID-19 um, early on. And, and it's used, electron microscopy in general is so important for materials research. So I just thought I'd quickly pull that up and share with everyone. Yeah, and, and also to add to that, so um, the, the internship that I worked last summer and also this past summer was in doing software development for actually like dual beam systems where you'd have like an electron beam and then a focus ion beam kind of at an angle. And then you would actually like, you would image one, uh, like one layer, you'd mill off one nanometer and then put, like do that over and over until you have a 3D reconstruction. And there's actually been a lot of work uh, that my company has been collaborating with on with like actually imaging COVID-19 and like the virus host interaction. And it's like, it's some pretty cool stuff. And like, even though that's that's kind of not explicitly like a materials materials problem, that's more of uh, the kind of engineering and electrical of that. But it, it is really cool that have, that we have access to like the CCEM that's related in this kind of work. And I'll say that. Sophie, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I was just going to add on to that point as well. I think it's super cool to see that that journal cover that um, Dr. Sask showed because it kind of brings back those like fundamental concepts of like um, kind of the crystalline structures that we learned about in like 2x and stuff with Dr. Zidomirsky so it's cool to see kind of the whole uh the whole message come together 
Um, so did anybody want to start um, with our response to how they got into academia or why they wanted to pursue research and kind of that side of yeah. things? Yeah, like even, even the, the, the kind of moment where it's like, now I know I want to pursue this kind of thing. So if anyone has an answer, speak up, go ahead. I, I can start, I guess. Um, so I was fortunate enough in my undergrad degree in material science and engineering to get uh, two different co-op placements. The first was with Evraz North America, which is a steel uh, pipeline fabrication company based in Saskatchewan. Um, so going there was kind of my first real exposure to the world of research. That was in my third year of my undergraduate degree. And I look at a lot of my mentors um, from my co-op role there, and a lot of them actually had um, postgraduate experience. So they had master's degrees or PhDs, and they were kind of in the positions that I could see myself in in the future, kind of in that research management type of role. Um, so that's what got me started. And then when I transitioned to my second co-op experience, uh, which was with Defense Research and Development Canada, uh, so working on the Naval Shipyard in Halifax, um, that's where I kind of got my first foray into the world of 3D printing metals. Um, but it was the same sort of thing where a lot of the people who had the, the roles and the careers that I saw myself in, um, they sort of had this, this, academic, this further academic background, this research background associated with a master's degree or a PhD. So that's kind of how I knew that I kind of wanted to pursue academia from that point onward. That's great. I can also share my experience. Despite I'm not so ahead in academia, maybe one day I uh, will have a professorship position. I would love that. But actually, I started to like I decided that I wanted to pursue graduate school and research very early in my undergrad, mainly because I've always loved learning and I've always been very curious. So I think research really gives you this opportunity to keep uh, challenging yourself uh, and you have all these uh, problems, all these questions you would like to answer. And yeah, it's it's really a great exercise to like really push you into keep learning and getting deeper and deeper knowledge about things. And Yes, and so this, I would say, it's the main reason. And biomaterials especially really resonated with me because despite I have a background in mechanical engineering and materials engineering, so often we don't really consider biomaterials. They are more like biomedical engineering, something like that, or biology. I really found myself uh, either discovering this other side of engineering, maybe it's slightly cl closer to science, and really how engineering can closely impact life quality of people in these uh, research fields specifically. Great. I, I actually had a question for uh, Kiara and Joe, Joseph, actually. So I, I talked to Joseph when I was in first year, and he kind of helped me choose materials uh, into my second year. And so I know that your Joseph isn't uh, from McMaster, like for his undergrad. Kiara, did you do your undergrad at McMaster or no? No, I actually did my undergrad in Italy, where I'm oh, from. Oh, OK. Nice. Yeah. I've never been to Europe, but anyways, um, so I have a question for you two. Uh, why did you choose to pursue your PhD studies at McMaster in material science? Sure. For me, so, at least, um, McMaster has a really strong reputation in health research, um, which biomaterials is kind of directly tied to. Um, so things like having the hospital on campus is a big plus for doing any sort of biomedical or biomaterials research. Um, so in that, I think McMaster is actually one of the strongest programs in the country for biomaterials development, biomaterials design, and things like that. Um, so sort of that aspect that drew me to McMaster was that kind of strong biomedical and biomedical focus with, with clinicians sort of readily available um, on campus. Yeah, I, I came to McMaster actually during my master as part of an exchange program. I was doing a master's in materials engineering in Italy and I was given the opportunity to come here, splitting my, like getting a double degree from McMaster and this other university in Italy. And so there, then I got the opportunity to work with Dr. Grenfield and I liked it so much that I decided to come back and started my PhD with her. So maybe I came here a bit by, by chance, but then I really enjoyed it. Nice. 
Yeah, that's really cool. But, and for the second years who, who may or may not know, we actually do have an exchange program exclusive to our materials program where we send students to Grenoble Institute of Technology in <clears throat> Grenoble, France. Uh, so, but you know, I don't know when that's going to happen, but it might come up. So just to keep that in mind. But yeah, so uh, Dr. Sask or Dr. C. Smirsky, if you guys have a response, I'd love to hear it for this question too. If not, it's, you know, it's cool, but go ahead. I can share it. Sure. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> experience. Um, I wouldn't say I, even in at the role as a graduate student like Kiara that I was 100% uh, that I yeah. that, that was the, the path for me and I got a chance in undergrad to do summer research to get slightly exposed to, to it working with graduate students and then started as a master's student and really enjoyed my project um, and the, the both of the work that my co-supervisor was doing and I had a chance to collaborate with other groups actually with Dr. Zita Mursky as a master's student and I and I love that opportunity uh, to apply areas to different uh, to different problems and and use all sorts of different instruments and, and work with others so that that was really exciting for me and something I enjoyed and I transferred into the PhD program and finished up and and just before defending I got a position uh, for a medical device company in Toronto, and I started working there. Got my my PhD, and I really enjoyed it. It was directly related to to the research area, and it was exciting um, for different reasons. I, I I finished up that that particular role with the company, and and then I had a couple maternity leaves. I did some teaching in between, and that is one thing I missed in industry was the teaching aspect. Um, and then there were other things, but I, although I really, I really enjoyed a lot of, and there, there's benefits to being in industry over academia, but see the teaching, the ability to really share your knowledge, what you're learning and what you're discovering um, in academic publications with the world is something that you don't get in industry for, for particular reasons of IP and such, but that I really uh, missed as well as yeah just being able to collaborate and interact with so many people so that brought me back to academia I'd say and I did work again with with the company uh, the medical device company which has now been bought by a larger company and I still have interactions with them so I'd say there's a lot of benefits there but I, there's a lot of great things that, about academia um, in being able to share and impact and, and answer a lot of these questions that are out there. Yeah, like I, I really like that answer too because I feel like there's often a misconception that people who lock in to do a master's and PhD and or PhD that you're kind of locked in for life. Oh, okay, I'll be a professor next, and I gotta do this for the next fifty. But no, it, it's really good to hear that there's so many options because because from what I at least from how I understand it now is when you get a PhD or you decide to pursue graduate studies, it's because you're really passionate about what you're studying and you you think that you can make a difference with that. And whether that leads you to industry or research, I think is a question that like for example for you you touched on both afterwards so you know it's something to think about but not super worrying so yeah thank you for that and dr zedemarski did you have anything you wanted to add to that point yeah hard to say uh, something i realized that something happened when i was in school in uh, grade five i realized that uh, uh, if I cannot solve a problem, I cannot sleep. And only when I solve a problem, I can go to sleep. And I still have the same disease now. And I, I like what I'm doing. I'm, I, I like new problems. I like new challenges. I like to read new uh, literature and learn and learn every day something. And I like biomaterials field. In the past, I, will, I was involved in the field of magnetically ordered ferroelectrics, then superconductors. But in each field, there is some saturation. There is not, not, nothing fundamentally new in those fields. But biomaterials is a booming field. It's all, we always have problems. We always have challenges. And it's really a very attractive field for me. And I, I'm sure you will like this field of research. That's it. That's great. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect a point as well that um, Dr. Zarab had put in the chat just for anyone who can't see it, who is watching the video later. Um, he's very excited about the exchange and he's very sure that it will still be happening and he'll be putting out some more information about that. So um, the second years who are watching this after the fact, you can 
be looking forward to that. Yeah, and he says by by then, which is 2022, COVID will be a distant memory and there will be peace on Earth. So that is a very nice thing to hear and think about. So we have that. That is so true. So I guess we will we'll get into our next question, I guess, just to keep things moving along. Um, I'm sure a lot of the second years on the chat, they're tuning in potentially because they're interested <laughs> yeah. in um, getting involved in research themselves. Um, so our next question is, are you looking for summer students? Are you looking to bring some undergrads into your lab or um, are, is that something that you're considering in, in the upcoming future? I, I can say, uh, so I'm always looking for, for new keen interested students. Um, actually, before I even officially started at McMaster, I was finishing up postdoc at Queens and I was able to interact and, and have a, a student from the iBioMed program who's now in materials uh, start work with me, even though I wasn't physically here and we were just getting the lab set up. So she even got to do some work at Queens and then she worked for me again with me, with our group again this this past summer uh, and got the NSERC USRA awards. Uh, unfortunately, things were not as we expected, but she still was able to get in the lab towards the end. And I had two other uh, students, one materials fellow and another iBioMed student work over the summer. And definitely every summer looking looking for more students that are interested and um, as well thesis students and, and I have some capstone groups, um, one working on a project with our, with our research team as well. So yes. Yes, definitely, and, and we'll be happy to, to chat right. with people now and in the future. All right, and, and how do you uh, suggest for interested students to approach you? I, oh, I mean, online approach you. Yeah, email is always a great place to start, and we can then set up a meeting time. I mean, events, events like this, normally in person is great at events <laughs> like this, but over Teams as well, we could arrange to, to chat over Teams. Um, right. But yeah, email is always great to start, and, and if I don't get back to someone right away. Feel free to to follow up, but I but I will I add it to my list and and um, yeah, I, I'll be able to set up meeting times when there when there's a an appropriate time. Yeah, yeah perfect. Sounds good. And and I guess we can ask. Uh, <laughs> sure, let's go next. Um, Doctor Sismarski, how about you on this end? Do you think you're taking students this summer? Uh, yeah, uh, this summer uh, two students did a fantastic job in my group, right. Rebecca Sikema and Kayla Baker, and they published three papers in uh, impact factor of one of the journalists, 10. And Rebecca nice. is first after of the paper, and uh, amazing job. And in the past, I supervised many uh, good summer students, and they contributed a lot to our research. And this research resulted in many interesting discoveries. For example, I showed you a slide with uh, orient oriented hydroxylapatite particles and multi-layer uh, multi films. And this is, uh, those uh, uh, pictures uh, were uh, from some research of one of my students. And in natural bone, hydroxylapatite particles are oriented, and this orientation results in unique mechanical properties. And uh, students synthesized those particles and uh, deposited coating, and she came to me and told me, you know what, something happened with, uh, with those particles when I deposited them, because X-ray diffraction pattern looks different. When I analyzed diffraction pattern, I, I told her, you forgot my two extra three cores because we discussed preferred orientation and, and you discovered that our technique result in preferred orientation similar to natural bone. Uh, some students did very nice discoveries and just I think courses we are teaching are very relevant to, to what they're doing in the lab. Okay. Great, great, thanks for that. All right. And uh, Kiara and Joseph, do you guys want to go ahead? How, or, or if you don't know, uh, but what do you guys know about uh, how Dr. Granfield is thinking about for this summer? Yeah, we usually take on 
about two to three um, undergraduate students every summer. Um, we usually start to look for applications around early December towards or maybe towards the end of December as well. Um, we usually do interviews in January. Um, and for most of our applicants, we actually really recommend applying for the NSERC uh, Undergraduate Student Research Award, so the USRA Award. Um, that means that basically you'll be coming into the project with uh, funding on your end as a student, um, which makes you a lot more kind of attractive as an applicant to our group, just because a lot of the times the process can be a little bit competitive. Um, but yeah, we usually take on about two to three students um, for bone related projects in the summer. And I guess the best time to reach out to Dr. Granfield or even myself or Kiara uh, might be around early December. Great. And for, for any of those wondering, uh, NSERC applications, you have to go do them on your own, but there's going to be a department wide email from uh, Chelsea Gregory, one of the secretaries for the department about the actual steps to take uh, and who you need to contact. There, there, there's like a whole bunch of things, um, but you don't have to worry about, I think that for at least a couple of months. But anyways, yeah. Uh, so, so thank you everyone for all the responses about the summer jobs. I have one last question about that in mind. And let's say if one of the second years here were to successfully be, uh, I, or I guess work in your lab in the summer, what do you think their work would look like in the case that we're either fully online or partially online? Like what, let's say if they can't get in the lab and you know build some lab skills with you along the way, then what kind of work do you think they'd be doing next summer if it was online? And whoever has, I guess, or like an answer, whether like talking about what the students did this, this summer and so on, then by all means, So in our group, at least, um, half the battle <laughs> is collecting the data and the other half of the battle is processing the data. Um, so a lot of the times, it's something actually Arrhenius mentioned uh, with his dual beam system. So we actually use that kind of microscope uh, in the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy. And we get these results where we want to segment out specific features in that. Maybe it's a COVID-19, uh, the, the virus, for example, that we want to segment out from its surrounding material. Um, so with a lot of our electron microscopy work, there's a lot, a lot of post-processing that has to be done, those types of images. Um, as well, I think with any sort of research position, uh, there's going to be naturally a lot of literature review just to kind of get um, you as a student up to speed on your topic so you can kind of be an expert in your field uh, by the time that you finish your summer research term. Okay. Uh, great, and I'd also like to add with the Computational Materials Society that's starting up soon, we will be going through a lot of these digital image processing things, or just in general, a lot of data processing that'll be really, really useful for professors and grad students who need help with this kind of thing. So look out for that. And uh, Dr. Sask, if you, you seem like you wanted to say something, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was trying not to talk <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I second that. There's, there's always time to be spent on, on literature and, and getting familiar with an area and help to write. Um, there were other things in terms of organizing uh, different things that um, we were looking to source in the lab was helpful from for a small portion of the time of the students um, and that really got them experience with, with what we need for lab work. Uh, one of the students was able to get in the lab and hopefully there'll be a chance next summer but, but we were able to keep the students busy with exciting projects anyways and actually we had one student the materials fellow work on a uh, a problem, a project that was involving um, simulations, so, uh, protein simulations on materials. So using some new uh, programs and doing that. And so we're looking to get more into that area. And actually, your uh, your group on computation is great. And, and any um, opportunities for students like that would be really exciting, I think, for them and and their projects in our group related to that. Great. And Oksana, you had a question. Uh, go ahead. Or you can type it, whichever works for you. Unmute your mic or, yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, I don't know if my camera's turning on. It's, it's kind of on and off. Yeah. Okay. Internet connection. Yeah. You're muted. <laughs> Oksana. Great. Right, I think I go. got it. <laughs> there you go. That was good. That was good. I have a question for Dr. Sask. Um, I'm curious to know how the microfluidic lung assist device works. 
Sure. So um, the, the mechanical engineering group worked on the development of that, the microfluidic components and the oxygenator uh, itself. And it went through many iterations and um, designs to then have this, um, a few different prototypes where it was then tested in animal models. So piglet models were used uh, to, and the blood flows through the device and we don't want it to clot because obviously then the device will no longer be able to, the blood won't flow and be able to provide the oxygenation that's needed uh, for the blood. Uh, and the ultimate goal is to be able to hook it up uh, to through umbilical access. So there's some work on the project developing those catheters um, and then not only modifying the oxygenator itself, but also all of the components of the device. So that's where, um, from a biomaterials standpoint, providing a method of surface modification is really important and then characterizing how we're, we're modifying the material and then testing it um, with different fluids and eventually blood. And there's been uh, animal work done and there'll be more further animal studies. Great, sounds good. And uh, what about you, uh, Dr. Sutomirsky? How was, I guess, the online experience last summer? And let's say if next summer is going to be the same, how would that look to you in your lab? <laughs> yeah. Uh, our projects are focused on production of materials and manufacturing of different devices. Uh, we're working with all types of uh, biomaterials like polymers, drugs. Uh, proteins, uh, nanoparticles uh, uh, with antimicrobial pro pro properties, uh, bioceramics, bioglass, and we'll continue to work on manufacturing on advanced uh, implants, advanced devices. And uh, this summer our research uh, was focused on analysis of literature and uh, work of some student and uh, it was very helpful to crystallize new directions for our, for our future research. And after this uh, literature search, we, we have very interesting directions for future, for future research. Great, thanks for that. And 